Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today, I'm happy to welcome counselor and author John Sadler to the podcast. John has lived with epilepsy for more than 50 years since his first seizure at the age of four. After decades of living with seizures and medications, John underwent brain surgery in his mid-40s. That surgery ultimately set him on a new career path to becoming a licensed professional counselor. Today, he mentors and counsels both epilepsy patients and caregivers. John is also the author of several books on epilepsy. He is here today to discuss his experiences and share his unique perspective as both an epilepsy patient and a counselor to fellow patients and caregivers. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Let's begin with your personal story. Tell us how epilepsy first entered your life. It was in 1963. I was four years old and had a very high fever. And uh, the the fever came down during the night, so my parents weren't aware that I was even sick when I went to bed. And early in the next morning, my mother had gone grocery shopping, and my uh, older sister, I'm the youngest of four, uh, one of my sisters came in to check on me, and she saw me kind of sitting up kneeling in a kneeling position. She knew something was wrong, so of course uh, she went and got a thermometer to check my temperature. uh, she slid it into my mouth, and being uh, in, in a seizure, I chewed right, you know, I just broke it off. And the mercury, fortunately, came out of my mouth along with all the glass because of the position I was in. But uh, when my mother got home, you know, this is back before cell phones and all that, uh, my sister told her what happened, and my mother grabbed me and took me off to the hospital. And I was in a seizure for about six to eight hours. Oh, my gosh. So um, my parents were told that not, they didn't, the doctors didn't know what, what I would be like when I came out of it. So my mother was really excited, though, when I woke up and looked at her. And the first thing I said to her was, Mommy, I'm hungry. <laughs> she just leaped out of her chair. You know, she just was like so excited that I responded that way. I imagine so. And knowing what we know about seizures now to have been in a seizure for six to eight hours, was there brain damage that they suspected? Or, I mean, you, you woke up and you started talking. So, I mean, that's that's remarkable. They thought there would be some significant damage. And, you know, as we know today, sometimes children can have seizures from just being, having a fever, but it's not epilepsy. However, for me at the time, they took me to another hospital and did an EEG and they saw that there was something out of sync and they said, okay, we got to treat this as epilepsy. And they put me on phenobarbital. You're diagnosed with epilepsy then at the age of four. What, what was the rest of your journey like? They start you on phenobarbital. Were you able to get control of your seizures during childhood? Actually, we did. Um, Basically, um, they put me on phenobarbital, and my siblings called me the little old man because I was slow to respond to questions or discussions. My uh, personality was kind of wiped out. I wasn't, you know, the, the vibrant running around little kid anymore. And for four years, I was kept on the phenobarbital. And after that, the doctor said, look, he hasn't had any more seizures. It's what they look considered seizures. They took me off of it. And I actually went about uh, nine years without um, losing consciousness again. But I was went to college, you know, I did grade through school and everything, go off to college, got on a sailing team, was in a horrific boat accident and knocked unconscious for, for a while. And back in, this was back in 1978, we didn't, treat any, you know, concussions were that big a deal. You know, the person still talked and walked and all that, they were fine. So they didn't do any treatment or anything for me. And a few weeks later, I started having more deja vu and auras. Didn't know what it was or anything. And a year later, I had a grandma seizure while taking an exam. When everything changed, I was back, go back to see the neurologist and basically, the neurologist said, well, it's kind of a freak thing. Don't worry about it. I'm putting you on Dilantin. Even though you had a history of seizures. Even though I had the childhood history, they said, don't worry about it. 
And six months later, um, I was in another classroom and I looked at the student sitting next to me and I said, goodbye, because I felt the aura coming on. And I woke up in the infirmary again, like I did the first time. And the second time I saw a really good neurologist who said, look, you have epilepsy. That's what you have. You're going to be on medication the rest of your life. This is what you have to do to take the medication. If you don't take it, you're going to have more seizures. So that was, that was an eye opener for me and uh, really hard to deal with because I lost my license, lost, I had to sell my car, all kinds of things went on and I was pretty depressed about it all. I, I want to ask you about that. You are in your early 20s, you know, young adult, making your way in the world and all of a sudden you have this resurgence and this responsibility of your epilepsy what were those social ramifications? Did you experience or feel stigma at that point? Oh, yes, big time. And one of the things my dad told me was, he said, never tell anyone you have epilepsy. Oof. So Why I'll, do you think he gave you that advice? Because in his generation, and even in that whole time frame, if employers found out you had epilepsy, you lost your job. So... Um, anyway, I was I pretty much kept quiet about it and took my medications, followed what the doctors told me, got sleep, ate regularly, stayed hydrated, took you know just basically followed the rules, and we had my seizures pretty much under control. You know, in the meantime, I got a job working for the Navy, and getting through the physical was the most difficult part because the doctor there told me that I was a freak and I would never be allowed to do anything more than sharpen pencils. I I mean, that brings tears to my eyes. That's the stigma. So you wonder why I would keep quiet about it for, for you know, and never mention it to people unless I had to. I'm so sorry that you experienced that. Well, what happened in the same day was I met my supervisor and he said, uh, I told him, look, I'm leaving. I'm not working here because this is what the doctor told me. And he said, well, the doctor can set one set of rules, but I'm your supervisor, and I'm going to set another set of rules. And I want, to, want you to meet Mark. Mark was another uh, employer of his who also had epilepsy. And Mark pulled me out of a really dark time of my life. Um, there were times that I thought of suicide. There were times I was just like, you know, being the stigma that I was carrying was too much. And meeting Mark was like, wow, okay, I got someone who can associate with me and help me out with medications and finding doctors and making sure we cover each other. And, you know, it took a whole lot of stress off when stress being a key trigger to seizures was a big help. Having a community can be everything and, yes. and having someone to relate to. And I, I sort of want to come back to that a little bit later in your story. Hi. This is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. Did you know that one in 26 Americans will develop epilepsy in their lifetime? For more than 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has funded cutting-edge, patient-focused research. Learn more about our mission to end epilepsy at cureepilepsy.org. Now back to Seizing Life. In your 40s, you decided to undergo brain surgery. Um, it's a big decision to undergo as an adult. I mean, it's yeah. a big decision to do regardless, but um, but I think especially as an adult when, when you're established. Well, not only established, but I had two sons. Uh, I was married, had two boys, and they actually helped me make that decision. Um, they didn't want me to have the surgery, but there were times like my, my oldest at the age of two recognized my seizures. Some of his first words were, uh-oh, daddy, when I clap my hands trying to kill a fly, because that was, in my partial seizures, I would do this. And that's some of his first words, so that was kind of like, whoa. And then another time, uh, when he was older, he was about 13, We were I was driving him back from a scout camp and had a seizure while driving. And when I came out of the seizure, I was so happy I had my foot on the brake. And then as my, as my peripheral vision came back, I realized it wasn't my foot, it was his. Oh my gosh. And had we gone another 100 feet, we would have plowed into some trees and stuff at the end of the road. 
and he had no seatbelt on. So, you know, I was like, wow, I, I really have to take care. I mean, I was taking care of myself as best I could. My neurologist worked with me. They helped me out. We, some new medications were coming along and so out of a breakthrough seizure. They put me on Dilantin plus another medication. And finally, the doctor said, we're out of medications. And my doctor finally said, you need to go to Johns Hopkins. <laughs> so I went over to Johns Hopkins and I, my internal medicine doctor had me have an MRI on my head. And I, well, first day I walked in and showed it to the doctor there. And Dr. Krauss looked at it and said, there's the location. We know where your seizures are coming from. That must have been a bittersweet moment because here you know that you are eligible for surgery, but that also means, oh my gosh, you're eligible for surgery. Surgery, right. So, you know, he gave me a whole list of ways we could treat it and got it more medications and all that. And I was like, no, let's head towards surgery. So the big question then was, what was the surgery going to do to me? And they said, look, it's so much damage in that part of your brain. We don't think you need to worry about it. So I had the, the surgery done, and the day after, Dr. Krause came into my room and he said, John, what's 100 minus 7? And I looked at him and I said, what's 100? And here I'm an engineer, okay? So I'm like, fine. I said, this number just appeared in my mind. I said, 92. And he said, I said, no, 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 that's not right. And it took me a little while, and I got to 93, and then he goes, minus 7. I'm like, I have no idea. My memory was still there, but having taken out the hippocampus on the left side, that was my, it's like the RAM in a computer. That was the RAM to access the information in the front of my head. My mind now had to track a whole new way to get there. So the information was still there, you just had to find the new road to get there. That's so it. how long did that take for you to recover those lost abilities? Um, a total of uh, nine years. Wow. Fortunately, where I work, they had um, a, a big evaluation that had to be done on a project and that involved all the numbers and everything. And they said, John, we don't care how long it takes you, but you go to it. What would have taken somebody three weeks took me three months. But the more I was doing it, the more I was learning, the more I was rewiring my mind, my brain. The biggest thing that happened to me, though, is I started meeting other people with epilepsy. And initially, it was kind of a little one-on-one -on -one thing. And, you know, people hear about what I've been through, and they came and you know, got in touch with me. But what really inspired me, it was about four years after the surgery, was a, um, a fellow that I met through work who had a son a four-year-old son who had a lot of the same surgery and medications I've been on with intractable seizures. And he looked at me and after I, you know, I sat there and he's telling me, he tells me his son has epilepsy and it was over a minute we sat, sat on the phone before I told him that I did too. Because I was in this argument with myself, should I tell him? No, I shouldn't. Yes, I can. You know, and when I did, I didn't realize how much hope I inspired in that person. And back in my college days, I was going to the University of Rhode Island and saw the word hope on the state seal. That's what pulled me through all of that. And then being able to turn around and give hope to somebody else, that my whole world just flipped over. I no longer had to be quiet and silent about my seizures. Which has to have been so liberating and sort of very easily lead me into my next question here, which is I understand that during this recovery process, you also decided that you were going to get a master's degree in counseling, <laughs> which just seems like the most daunting thing while you're in recovery, while you have this job, uh, while you have a young family. Uh, but it sounds like you were inspired to sort of move in this other direction. Tell us about that. Well, like I just mentioned, you know, this the, talking to this person with a child with epilepsy and he got back to me many times thanking me, you know, and then he'd tell me things about, you know, his son had a seizure at a swimming pool. And I said, sunglasses might help because of the reflection of the light in the pool probably triggered the seizures. I didn't realize how much I knew with, and could share with other people. 
So my counselor said to me, he said, John, you really ought to consider becoming a a pastoral counselor. And I was like, what's that? And and anyway, I looked into it and it seemed to fit me really well. So I applied to Loyola University and I wasn't sure whether I'd get in or not, but it make a long story short. I got in, my first class was in humanities. The professor was an older gentleman. Um, I failed the first exam because I, my memory issues and he got these fill in the blank questions and I couldn't, I could give you the first letter to the answer, but I couldn't spell out the rest of the word. And, uh, another fellow student made sure I told the professor everything that was going on. And he immediately said, well, we're not going to count that exam. What do we need to do? And I said, don't give me a multiple choice of A, B, C, D. Give me a whole list of words. You can put 20, 30, 40 words on there, and I'll find them. And I'll know the answer. I'll recognize it. So what he did was he, um, for everybody in the next exam, he had nine to ten words to, to fill in the blanks. And some of them were very similar, but I got, I mean, I managed to get a B on the exam. What really got me, though, was, you know, what inspired this man to help me so much And it wasn't until the very last class that he shared with everybody about how his mother had epilepsy and how it inspired him to become a pastoral counselor. Oh, my word. It's amazing once you start sharing your story, just how many people you find out are also affected by epilepsy and maybe aren't sharing their story because they're nervous too. So now you counsel people with epilepsy and it's, you know, I I wonder having been through counseling yourself, having this degree, uh, being a person with epilepsy, and I understand that you've also been a caregiver of someone with epilepsy, what is it, what are some of the common themes that you find coming up as you're talking to people? I go between being a mentor and a counselor. So a lot of people who are living with epilepsy, I'm more of a mentor. People who are you know, caregivers, I'm more of a, um, as a counselor, trying to help them understand it. Epilepsy can turn your world upside down, but ask questions. You know, make sure that the, if the medication is making you feel worse than having a seizure. Make sure you not you know, tell the doctor and you're going to change it. And sometimes you may have to find another doctor. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that I try to do is inspire hope. One of the things I learned as a mentor and a counselor is hope now for me now stands for helping other people with epilepsy. I love that. The biggest thing that I like, like in Facebook and all, where people are sharing their stories or asking questions and the responses they can get, you know, we're not in this battle alone anymore. I mean, I was very isolated for most of my life, and then I was able to come out and say, you know, yes, yeah, I can help other people. I certainly have a love-hate relationship with social media, but building community and finding that you know we're not alone on whatever our life journey and circumstances may be um, certainly is powerful and strengthening. So, John, I want to know, how are you doing today you had you've had brain surgery you've been on and off medication for a majority of your life are your seizures controlled how are you feeling i'm actually doing really well with the seizures i have not lost consciousness in over 14 years Woohoo! yes i mean <laughs> but i'll tell you the first few years i was having several auras a day after the surgery and the surgeon said he wished he'd taken out just another quarter inch. He would have taken all of it out. But um, anyway, with time, as my brain healed and rewired and all, I only have very brief auras, maybe less than 10 seconds, maybe up to 30 seconds, about three or four times a year. One of the things that I'm going through right now is learning about the long-term effects of some of the medications I've been on. And I have some liver damage, um, and we're going to be doing some surgery and all soon. I'll probably, it, we're not sure exactly what it all is, but I have tumors in my liver now. 
So we're gonna, that's gonna be an adventure I'm on for the next six months at least. I'm so, so sorry to hear that. And please know that, you know, we are thinking of you as you embark on this next journey. And just, you know, I think it's, a, it's another sign for all of us of how imperative research is so that we can move past these medications that potentially have these long term side effects and can cause significant damage. So I thank you for sharing that with us. I, and I, I do genuinely hope that um, you're able to find answers and find health. Um, well, that's, that's would, a key reason right there why I look at the research and all that's being done. Absolutely. So often epilepsy is referred to as, as an invisible disease, not just because um, many times the seizures can't be seen, but you know, it's, it's also just not talked about. And I think that there is even so much not known within the epilepsy patient community. Uh, so many questions out there that even folks with epilepsy who are caregiving of people with epilepsy, they just don't have the information. What can those of us in the epilepsy community do to change this? That's pretty hard because you're talking about trying to change whole communities and moving to from I used to live in Baltimore and now I live down here in, in North Carolina on the eastern side and the eastern shore and all. And the eastern shore people don't talk about epilepsy. You know, just trying to get people to come out, you know, yeah, I have it, and, I'm the, and that's all you get. It'd be better if there'd be more community interaction of some kind that we could get going with this. So I mean, one of the things that I try to do to help people is write a couple books about it. The first one that I wrote is called Weathering the Storms. And it's about, it, it's about to help educate people. Um, and it's t the subtitle is Living with and Understanding Epilepsy. So, yes, it's got you know, a big piece of my personal story in it. But I use it a lot kind of like the counselor. You know, I start off with think, uh, information about epilepsy. And then I, I finish it up with a section about the caregivers. Um, and I had a parent that I helped out, like I mentioned earlier, who had a child, had all these seizures, and she helped me put together a caregiver program. Um, based on my experience of being a caregiver, I wrote another book that's fictionalized, uh, and it's called In the Midst of the Storms, um, a story of trauma, faith, and hope. And it's all fictionalized. It's, you know, it flows very nicely. And, it, you know, there's a whole storyline to it. But the main piece of it is, you know, a person who's dealing with PTSD of being a caregiver. And that's the post-traumatic stress disorder of being a caregiver. Things I learned personally being the caregiver of my, um, my next door neighbor. Uh, we started having simple seizures, simple partial seizures, and eventually it was over 18 months, they were out uh, grand mall seizures several times a week. So yeah, it's pretty hard. It can be pretty trying. Um, so it's kind of get more, more we can educate the caregivers, the better you know better things can be. I think the education piece is just so important and empowering, and sort of taking that outside of the epilepsy community. What is, you know, the public perception about epilepsy that you would like to see changed? Well, th that's pretty hard in a, in a lot of ways, but uh, from an overall, I think within a community kind of a setting, um, if there's a child in the, in the neighborhood who has epilepsy, then it should be discussed with everybody, you know, with everybody in the community. And so people aren't scared of it. They know what, and as long as they know what to do, that can be a huge help. Um, I mentioned the parent that I helped with a child who had the, all those seizures in a short period of time. And she helped me, and we worked with each other in educating the, the teachers of the school what to do if her child had a seizure. And the more we can just educate the community and make epilepsy a, at least talk about seizures um, and make that you know, a topic that's easy to, to talk about and people aren't afraid of it, that would be the greatest thing we could do. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's such, it's actually such simple 
on paper anyway, simple advice and simple steps that we can take just talking about it and educating people. And it's some, but it's something that everybody can do within the community to teach their neighbors, to teach their community, and then hope that that just, that message spreads outward and outward. Um, sort of by word of mouth, we can someday, you know, relinquish and defeat this stigma. John, I am just so honored to have been able to speak to you. You are a wealth of information and, and the work that you are doing to bring hope to this community, um, to our community, is it's it's really beautiful. And, and uh, while I wish that you were not a part of this Epilepsy Club, we sure are happy and proud to have you as a member. So thank you so much for joining us today and for all that you do for us. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, John, for sharing your personal experiences with epilepsy and your insights as a counselor. As John noted, epilepsy doesn't just affect the person diagnosed. It impacts that person's family, friends, and community in numerous ways. As an organization founded by mothers of children with epilepsy, Cure Epilepsy has always understood the multiple impacts of a diagnosis. That's why we are dedicated to patient-focused research, which we know is the best way to discover new therapies and cures that will bring relief to both patients and their families. Please help us continue to fund epilepsy research by visiting cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Your support and generosity are greatly appreciated. Thank you. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Cure Epilepsy. The information contained herein is provided for general information only and does not offer medical advice or recommendations. Individuals should not rely on this information as a substitute for consultations with qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with individual medical conditions and needs. Cure Epilepsy strongly recommends that care and treatment decisions related to epilepsy and any other medical conditions be made in consultation with a patient's physician or other qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with the individual's specific health situation.